One of the most talented, beautiful, loved broadcasters in Australia these days is Richard Feidler. He's also one of the most busy. Um, you probably remember Richard Feidler from the hugely successful Doug Anthony All-Stars. Hand it up if you do. Yes, we all go way back. Um, he, uh, Rich has gone on to be quite an all-rounder in media and he's presented a, a huge uh, array of television sh uh, shows for the ABC, including Race Around the World, uh, so we can blame him for John Safran. Um, the arts and culture show series Vulture, which I also worked as warm-up on, and it's I don't know whose fault it is that that show got axed, but... Uh, just quietly, I blame Richard. Um, and Aftershock, I don't know whether you guys saw Aftershock, it investigated radical new technologies. And after that, you know, there's a lot of gloom and doom about technology, but don't forget what we're also saying, that technology is neutral and it's also beneficial. It's how and why and how much we use it is what we have to look at. Um, these days, Richard Feidler presents the Conversation Hour on ABC Local Radio throughout New South Wales and Queensland at 11 a.m. He then, he consumes his lunch, I think, intravenously as quickly as possible and then he hosts afternoons on 612 ABC Brisbane and ABC Gulf Coast FM from 1pm. Um, I think he has a gambling debt just quietly. Um, now he is, I would like to welcome Richard Feidler to the stage. Please get a round of applause going. He's going to be joined to talk about the past to mastery by Matt Moran yeah. and Simon Tedeschi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Matt Moran, of course, great Sydney chef, uh, long-standing fixture on the local and national food scene in Australia. Simon Tedeschi, classical musician, pianist, child prodigy, a man who has won many, many competitions, performs all over the world, has branched out into jazz and improvisation. Please welcome them both, Simon and Matt. Gentlemen, the theme is personal stories, the path to mastery, how you get to sort of be, uh, the, uh, find yourself in the position where you are today. Can we begin by talking about the creative environment, the kind of environment you like to find yourself in when you're actually trying to make something new? Uh, writing a book some years ago with a friend of mine, I, I found something odd. I, I like to write in an environment which is really quiet, in the, do it in the morning, no, nothing to interrupt me or bother me. And I was shocked to discover the way he writes is he turns the sex pistols on really loudly, <laughs> gets drunk, and then scribbles down something mad and then makes some sense out of it. Uh, so I'll start with you, uh, Simon. Tell me what kind of environment you like to be in when you're creating something new or coming up with new ideas. Well, when I'm putting together a piece or constructing a piece or working out an interpretation, I certainly don't want the sex pistols. No. <laughs> um, I, uh, I need quiet. Um, uh, not that I don't appreciate the Sex Pistols for what they are, but uh, when, I'm, when I'm putting together Mozart or Beethoven or, or Brahms, something like that, I certainly need quiet. I need, uh, I need to be able to sink into the music. And it, comes to, it gets to the point where uh, I can't even have any hint of any other music playing because there'll always be a part of my brain that's analysing it somehow, in some way. Um, I can't even sleep with music. I can't anymore. There's part of your mind that starts to find traction with whatever it is you're hearing, going, oh, that's doing that, that's playing here, that's twisting there. It's very uh, interesting how it happens. It's attraction and it's almost a friction because um, it's, it's uh, like this constant cognitive dissonance that's going on when I'm you know, trying to do something else. It's, uh, I suppose uh, when you've been doing it for as long as I have, it, uh, it becomes like that. It becomes just so all-engrossing. So music is your worst enemy in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a sense, but usually when I'm listening to music, I'm not doing much. I'm usually shopping, which I don't like to do anyway. So I'll usually stand there with whoever I'm with and I'll think, oh, C minor seven, going to A minor, <laughs> going to D seven, <laughs> which I suppose is uh, an interesting reflection on my social life. Yeah, particularly, <laughs> <laughs> particularly when it's Billy Joel or Kenny G that's, uh, that's happening. <laughs> How about you, Matt? Uh, cooking's a, a, a different an art that's practised in such a different way. Mm. Uh, do you like to have perfect silence or indeed do you like to have music happening in the background while you're making something? Uh, not so much music. Um, you know, it, it can be anywhere and any time. You know, I could be on a treadmill, um, you know, watching a, a food network and, and just seeing things that sort of trigger, you know, maybe I'd like to do something with that. But uh, I, I, tend to, I tend to wake up in the middle of the night quite often thinking about dishes and food and what I would like to do. And which is kind of weird because the first thing I think of every morning um, is, you know, what I'm going to eat that day. 
Um, That's funny, because I get hungry at 12 as well. <laughs> um, and it's always, it's always like, you know, what, what I'm going to eat, and, and you know, I, I constantly think about it. Even this morning, you know, I've been away for a few days up in, in Queensland to the Queensland restaurant, and uh, this morning I woke up and I said straight away to my wife, I said, what are we going to eat tonight? And, uh, and she said, well, you know, it's up to you. And I, I got in the car with my little boy and I was driving him to school and I said, what do you want to eat tonight? And, and you know, it's the question I ask everybody. And uh, Harry said, well, we had chicken last night, we had chops on, on Saturday. So, you know, you, you, can, you can look at those two things, Dad, and, and decide what you want to cook, you know, for us yourself. So I think it's down the fish markets on the way back from here today. <laughs> One of the things the chef and the classical musician have in common is both uh, what you do requires hours and hours and hours, and days, weeks, months, years of practice. Work, 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 mm. work, work. Is there a side of you that's attracted to what you do because it's hard work? Simon. Oh, I mean, that's one of those questions, what comes first, the chicken or the yeah. egg? Um, it's a difficult one. No, I would have to say when I started the piano, I wasn't... Um, enticed by it because of the sheer amount of work it took. There was just something about the timbre of the piano, the sound it produced, the fact that I could have an entire orchestra at my disposal um, <laughs> that excited me enormously. And of course, then the work followed, but it wasn't work for me, it was playing. So you're binging on something you enjoy. Absolutely. I feel guilty being here talking about this, quite honestly. <laughs> but I am at a Buddhist convention, so no, no guilt. <laughs> <laughs> no guilt. Am I the only Jew here? <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Matt? Is there something about you that finds the joy in the work through the hard work? Yeah, look, I, you know, for me, it, uh, you know, half my life, or, you know, half my life up until the age of 15 when I started cooking was, was on a dairy farm, so, or on a farm. And, you know, as a young kid growing up on a farm, you know, you, you were made to work. So the work ethic wasn't really that much of an issue for me. It was more the fact that, you know, when I left school and I hated school and school hated me, and, uh, and I started cooking, um, you know, I became so obsessed and so in love with it, it, it didn't seem like work. And I, I remember, you know, growing up in the suburbs in Sydney and, you know, having only Sundays off, and I thought everyone in the, in the world worked six days a week and 90 hours a, 90 hours a week in a kitchen or, you know, whatever they did. And, and Sundays I used to hang around my mates who, might have been a motor mechanic or a spray painter or whatever. And they used to, um, you know, Sunday afternoon would come, they'd say, damn, I've got to go back to work tomorrow. And uh, for me, I used to think to myself, God, I, I must be the only person in the world that I, I can't wait to get back to work tomorrow to, to try and learn something new. So, you know, the, the six days, 90 hours a week in the kitchen, to me, it never really seemed like work. I, I just really, really enjoyed it. There's, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Malcolm Gladwell book, Outliers. I don't know if many people here are yeah, familiar with that. Um, the theory behind... Malcolm Gladwell's study of people who have uh, shown mastery in a whole range of professions, whether it's the, the arts, music, business, whatever, uh, uh, any form of creativity, is 10,000 hours. Yeah. Uh, that was the I, I read the book. I, don't read, read the book? A lot of, I don't read a lot of books. My wife gave it to me because she thinks I'm a nutter too. So. He says, the key to success in any field is to a large extent a matter, a matter of practicing a specific task for a total of around 10,000 hours. Not exactly 10,000 hours, but around that. And he even found the Beatles this is true of the Beatles, who played three gigs a night in Hamburg, I don't know, five, six nights a week or something for several years. That's how they got that kind of skill set up. What, what do you think of that view, Simon? Well, I would say for a pianist, for a classical pianist and for, I suppose, any musician, there's a big difference between playing and practising. And in a sense, playing is a type of practising, but it is not practising, because practising is not the pleasurable stuff um, practicing is, is not the stuff that sounds good. Practicing is the grind. Practicing is the occasional swearing. Practicing is the, uh, is the reducing things to their most elemental technical levels. So you can uh, practice the small movements that eventually make up the larger movements. Um, so um, it's different to playing. And yet, as I said, at the same time, playing many, many times is itself a form of practicing because no matter how many times you practice, that doesn't mean you'll be a good performer. Mm. How about you, Matt? Being a chef means you have to master a whole range of different cuisines, work, work, work. Yeah, look, food is, food is, is all about knowledge, and, and to get knowledge of food, it, it takes time and it takes hours. And, you know, any, any chef or any person in the world that, that proclaims to know everything about food and, and cooking food, um, you know, they're, they're absolute idiots because there's, there's just always so much to learn. And, and I think the, the great thing about my industry is that you, you are constantly learning and there's constant, constantly new product out there, there's, there's new trends. 
Um, you know, I remember the, the first series of, of um, MasterChef uh, I did, and um, there was a young girl that I sort of, you know, sort of mentored a little bit along the way, Justine Schofield, and I remember she said to me, um, you know, after the show had finished, you know, Matt, how, how long is it going to take me to learn everything? You know, because I want to know it, like, really quickly <laughs> so that I can sort of move on. And I just looked at it and I was just dumbfounded. And it was like, you know, at that point in time, I'd been in the industry for 25 years and I was just like, you know, sweetheart, I have no idea. You know, there, there's so much more to learn. You know, you, you can't learn it overnight. And, and you know, knowledge is, is being in kitchens as, as long as, it, you know, as long as you can. And, and you can obviously learn basics, how to cook, um, you know, how to fry a piece of meat or fry a piece of fish, but there's so much more involved than just putting something, you know, in a pan. And, and that's why we, we don't, uh, you know, not all the restaurants that we have in the world are all brilliant because, you know, some people just don't get it. It's the same as a pianist. I mean, one of the great things about being a pianist is that the repertoire is so immense, mm. you will never learn it. You will never even understand one-fifth of it. And that's the beauty. And it's a cliche, but it's the journey. It's not really getting there to a point, oh, I'm a good pianist now, because you never really will be as good as the music is. Uh, see, see, when I learn how to do, you know, jingle bells on the piano, I thought that, I, that was, now I can actually play the piano. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong. Obviously. Same with me and macaroni cheese. <laughs> <laughs> when did the uh, when did it become apparent to you both that the, you might have a, a creative life, where the creative life sort of said, you know, opened a door for you, or banged on your, banged, slapped you around the top of the head, and said, you should step down this path, son. Well, I um, was first told I was a good pianist, I suppose, by my mother during the uh, Sydney Estedford, and it's now reverted back to the name of Sydney Estedford. Sorry, can we go back further than that to when you even wanted to become a pianist? Well, I always wanted to be a pianist, but that's very much tied in with uh, this knowledge that, uh, wow, this is really the course my life is going to take. And at that particular competition, I remember to my great surprise, I won it, and it was an open age competition. And the person who came second was 21, and I was eight. And I, and I remember this, this gentleman um, took the adjudicator's report, ripped it up, and threw it at the adjudicator. And at the time, I just remembered being bewildered, and I felt responsible for this man. How, how can I have made someone so unhappy? And then, of course, later on down the track, you realise, oh, of course, I hate me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew from that point, this is really uh, going to be a very interesting, challenging, and colourful life. Did you deserve to beat him, or were you just so goddamn adorable at the age of eight? I had the most beautiful little bow tie. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, though, when you heard the piano? That made, can you think of the, the first time you heard the kind of music you wanted to play? It's, it's almost a magical experience for me, because there was a boy in my primary school who was you know, in year one, and he had cerebral palsy, actually. He was quite profoundly disabled. And I remember him sitting at the piano and playing very badly, partially because of his disability. And I was um, so taken aback by the range of sounds and colours that the piano could produce that something in me just immediately knew I had to be a pianist. And in an interesting reversal of roles, I nagged my mother for piano lessons. And there happened to be a piano teacher on our street and that's how it happened. Um, but uh, I didn't let go for the whole week. I was just constantly telling her I, I really want to take lessons. When you're a child prodigy, do people, as you were at the age of nine, winning competitions, do, do people, I'm sure people stare at you, and grown up stare at you in a certain kind of way, and that stare is laden with expectations? Oh, and is it terribly. hard to it's break away from that and follow your own path? It's very strange how people would look at me when I was eight, nine, ten. It was very weird. And some people would even come up to me and say, don't get a big head. And I would think... <laughs> And being eight or nine, you know, <laughs> you think, what are they talking about? Um, and if anything, those kind of comments were um, quite deleterious for me because um, they didn't serve to help me. I didn't have a big head. Um, they served to make me question my own ability, which was, uh, I think, not a good thing to do for a child. Um, and now I feel, I think, justifiably proud of my accomplishments without, but at the same time, retaining the humility that's necessary to be a musician. How Australian is that? We've got a child prodigy on our hands. Pull your head in. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I think if you told an eight-year-old kid to, you know, 
you know, be careful, don't get a big head, that'll stop eating. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't yeah, think it was quite true. the same for you, Matt, was it? Uh, you didn't have the kind of weight of grown up expectations in the new age of nine. I don't think your dad, when you were nine in Badgerys Creek, said, Son, one day I'm going to force <laughs> you to make perfect osso buco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was far it, was far it? from no. it. You know, growing up on the farm was very much, um, you know, eating a, a piece of protein and, and three veg. Um, and, you know, we, we never ate seafood, you know, until I was 15, I thought I hated seafood, but in actual fact, I'd never eaten it. So there was no, no expectation to become this, you know, amazing, amazing chef. It was just one of those things that, um, you know, I, I kind of, I fell into and, and fell in love with it. And uh, I suppose at college, you know, I was the youngest in my year at college, only being, you know, uh, 15 when I first started. And uh, knowing that I didn't do that well at school, but I kind of somehow was excelling at college. and. And uh, my first, uh, or when I did my apprenticeship, which was one of the top restaurants in Sydney at the day, was very, very disciplined, um, incredibly disciplined. You know, things that we, uh, things that happened in that kitchen just, this would not happen anymore, obviously, because there'd be uh, a complete um, uproar and outcry. And uh, I remember... Wow, really? What are you talking <laughs> about here? Oh, yeah, violence? Yeah, yeah. Violence and, you know, getting kicked in the back of the leg if you weren't standing straight after being standing for 16 hours. Um, but I, I, I kind of remember, you know, after about a year or two, there was a lot of apprentices there and a couple of them had been there longer than me and they had a little bit more authority than me and, and I kind of thought, you know, I must be doing the right thing because I wasn't getting the bollocking anymore. It was always the other guy, so I kind of felt good about that. <laughs> it wasn't a pat on the head, it just wasn't so much know, violence you never, in your life. You, you, never, you, <laughs> never, you never got a pat on the head, but you, um, <laughs> if you did something wrong in the middle of service, it was, you know, all hell would break loose. Mm. Uh, Simon, being a, a, a classical pianist, you're nearly always working off composition material that's created by another artist, a, a composer. Who has the upper hand? Is it you or the, the Oh, that's the uh, eternal question, isn't it? Um, it's a difficult one, and different pianists in different ages, and even the same pianists within different periods have approached that question differently. Um, I feel it depends very much on the composer. If I'm playing Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, these guys are the greats and they have their their vision and so much is written there on the score and if you observe the score everything to do with the score then that's you know really the penultimate interpretation because if you're a musician if you're a decent musician you will always inject your own personal interpretation into well, the it's piece. refreshing to hear that because often musicians will say, oh, I, I venerate the great master and uh, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. But I just don't believe that really happens with musicians, particularly penis. I'm sure it's like, right, Bach, cop this or something yeah, like that. Yeah, very much. And, you know, like, like any field, it's, so much, it's a lot of posturing there. It's like, I'm going to play Bach, you know, with my head or something. Or I'm going <laughs> to... Um, there's a lot of posturing that goes on. But really, the composers, these guys, they're so much greater than us that it's really our honour to be playing them, and it's not their honour, their posthumous honour for us to be playing their work. Really? Do you have to think in those terms, though, I am, I am somehow going to channel the, the art of a godlike creature? I mean, you have to bring your own profound uh, confidence to that, don't you? And, and, and impose that upon the work, don't you, Simon? Certainly. I mean, it's, it's again, um, there's always an ego behind it. There mm. has to be an ego, but at the same time, it can't be... A, uh, a narcissistic, in my view, a narcissistic looking into one's own image, reflected image. This is Beethoven I'm playing, or Mozart, or Bach, and I have the honour to be the medium, the conduit for this performance, and the audience are here as well, and they play a very vital role. Or if there's no audience, if it's a recording, that's a completely different type of playing. Um, if I'm playing jazz, though, of course, then we're talking about a different type of mentality. So. Uh, yeah, a different one. But I mean, the way you're talking about playing classical, then it sounds like you're a cover band. <laughs> Why are you not a cover band? We're not a cover band because we are taking great works that have been played, you know, time and time again, and we are injecting something new into them by virtue of the fact that we are different people, we have different brains, um, uh, the algorithms that, that our brains use to understand music are entirely different. We have different life experiences, but these life experiences will come about naturally. They won't come about because you're superimposing your personality onto it. This is just, I mean, I'm sort of old school in this way. I just really respect the composers that I play. And interestingly, I've been accused of being idiosyncratic before. Um, so you just can't win. But um, I, I just place them in great stead. Now, now Matt, I, I suppose you're, uh, 
your, the way you cook is often described as you know, modern Australian cooking. I don't know if you're happy with that as a, uh, as a genre or not, but that means taking various traditions from our region, really, and, mm. and our heritage, and combine, combining them into something new. What is that like for you, taking the cuisine of uh, a long time, uh, with a lot of history and heritage mm. behind it, out of the hands of the purists who say you can only do it this way and changing it round. I think what's happened though in, in, over the years, you know, from that sort of you know classic French French cooking, which obviously still does exist, but what's happened is is in our industry in, in the last sort of 25 years, I suppose, from from when I started to, to now, um, you know, it, it's modernised. But what's happened is that the technology has has gone, you know, tenfold. Um, you know, all the sous vide and slow cooking and, and um, all the gels and the, you know, the El Bullies and the Heston Blumenthal's and, and that's being influenced by everybody um, all around the world. So in the last 25 years or the last 20 years even, you know, cooking has just changed so much. Um, for me, I, I, I still like the purity of food. I like, um, you know, t to get great produce and find the best produce and, and not so much do very little to it, but try to keep it in its true form. Um, you know, I love what those, those guys have done, and, and I, you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of doing it, but for, for me and my restaurants, you know, I would rather go out and find the perfect sea scallop um, in its perfect form and, and put it with something. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be something with a little bit of technology in, in whatever I put it with, but for you to come in and, and see that, that beautiful natural form scallop rather than getting it, freezing it, pureeing it, adding something to it to put it back into the perfect shaped scallop. I, I just don't get that. So, um, you know, I, I like to have that sort of puristic form and, and, and you know, put something modern on the side of it, but, uh, yeah, not, uh, not kind of change it too much from its elements. So one of the things that makes you kind of refreshingly different from a lot of classical musicians is that you've been branching out into jazz and improvisation, and can I quote you here from uh, an interview? Quote, most classical musicians couldn't improvise a fart at a Hungarian wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Do you recall the first time you had to improvise in front of a live audience? Do you think you could give me some media training at some point? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do. I do remember... Oh, geez, I regret that quote. Um, I Good quote, do, though. <laughs> it's and it's the, true, isn't it? I mean, To a degree, it's true, but yet classical musicians up until, ooh, 150 years ago all improvised. They all improvised Hummel, Liszt, Beethoven. They all improvised. Um, it was just part of learning your instrument. If you couldn't improvise your instrument, how could you play somebody else's or your own stuff? Um, my my uh, sort of route is a little bit different. I was just very taken by... Uh, um, the tradition of African America. And I remember first working with Kevin Hunt at the uh, New South Wales Art Gallery, and I had to improvise. And he just suddenly, and it was a big concert, and he looked at me and he said, okay, take a solo. And I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and it happened, and it probably was a very bad one. But the main thing is that it happened. And now, like any other language, I've been speaking it for so long that I'm quite good at it. I'm not brilliant at it, but I'm quite good, and I'm getting better and better. And how is it different? How is it, what's, how, how are you conscious of how you're thinking and feeling when you improvise as opposed to taking something from the school? Oh, look, the better I get at it, the more I realise how different it is. Mm. For me, anyway, classical music is uh, so much about controlled tension. Um, there has to be this tension there, but it's controlled. And with jazz, it's so much to do with the history of African America about release, about so much emotional release of that pent-up pain. And so the more relaxed you are in jazz, the better it is. But if I played classical like I play jazz, it would just, it would not work at all. For a start, the rhythm, the whole idea of rhythm and articulation is completely different. And that's a whole big discussion. Is there the equivalent of jazz in cooking, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose there is, you know, sort of, some people sort of cut loose a little bit um, and, and go a little bit more out there. Um, I bet I you I'm, I'm a I'm better cook than you are a pianist. <laughs> you don't know that for sure, do you? We don't know that for sure, do we? No. And we probably never find out because, you know what, there's no kitchen here. <laughs> I, I do see a piano, but there's, there's no kitchen here. So, you know, there's a bit of catering here, aren't there? There's a bit of catering. Unless you invite me out for dinner one day, you know, yeah, we'll probably you never know. That's a good invitation. Now you're on the spot, aren't you? <laughs> um, 
Do Last week, like I had the uh, pleasure of interviewing former Prime Minister Paul Keating, who, uh, who his most recent book, he, be he begins <laughs> by saying, all of the things my speech is here, it's, it's really all about, the overarching thing is the creative urge. That's the thing that lies behind everything in life. And he, he said something interesting uh, when I interviewed him. He said, where passion and reason vie with each other, the outcome is invariably deeper and of an altogether higher quality. So what, do you just, do you, what does that make you think? When I you think, Paul, like, like a, a lot of the things he says is absolutely spot on. Um, I uh, think that, you know, it's all very... People say, oh, look, you're playing the piano and I love your passion or whatever, and that's great, but that word is just so much a little piece of it, mm. and there has to be intellect. Mm. There must be intellect. Again, I'm going back to the great music, which was just so erudite, and there must be a brain and there must be a personality, and there must be thought behind every action. He's, he's implying struggle there too, isn't he? Vying with well, each other. I heard a very interesting <laughs> phrase once, and that is that no great music um, came originally from a place of happiness. It causes happiness, but it never mm. came from a place of happiness. And I thought that that was a very interesting phrase. I'm still not quite sure what to make of it, but I'm more comfortable with it the more I think about it. Great food comes from a place of hunger. Uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> <coughs> I'd just like to say, I, I, I miss Paul Keating. <laughs> yeah, look, you know, I, I think of anything, um, you know, if, you, if you're really passionate about something that you do and you, you dedicate your life to it and you, you, you love it and, and, you know, it's inspiring, and I think you, you, you obviously become quite good at it, you know. I think it's, um, I think with anything, you know, I, I'm just one of those lucky guys, I suppose, that I found something in life that, you know, obviously in the beginning for me it was very... Um, you know, it was very disciplined, which I probably needed after living in Blacktown for 10 years. And, um, you know, and it, it would sort of got into it and fell in love with it. And, and you know, obviously great things came from it. Or good just, things. Just finally, there's the kind of mystery of where ideas arise from in the first place. Um, uh, Neil Gaiman, the writer, you know, said once that uh, in an interview that He's often asked at conventions, you know, where do, where do you get your ideas from? That's the thing, and everyone laughs, you know, and, and the creatives on the panel will mock that person. Mm. And, and he says, the reason why they mock is because they don't know. Mm. They really don't know. Something new arrives in the world. You know, science tells us that something can't come from nothing, but I think it clearly does in the creative act, doesn't it? it comes, something comes out of nothing, really. Mm. I tend to think of David Lynch, who I think is one of the great, great yeah. geniuses of the 20th century, Absolutely. and David, you know, a razor head, his uh, yeah. great film, and, you know, people were like saying, well, what is this about, David? And he said, oh, it's a film about Philadelphia. <laughs> and Blue I think Velvet, <laughs> one of the best movies ever. You know, yeah. Twin Peaks. Yeah, <laughs> but when you apply language <laughs> to, what, to what art is, you immediately dilute it. Language is, to a, in a sense, always a lie. Talking about art is always a lie because you're diluting something that is transcendent. Right? So it's best left unsaid. In a sense. So let's all go home. OK, we can go home. <laughs> Not before Simon Tedeschi agrees to cook up a three-course meal for everyone here. Failing that, <laughs> uh, there is a piano here, and I'd like to invite Simon to actually play something for us, please. Everybody.
sensational. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Tedeschi. Give a warm and round of applause Moran. and gratitude to Richard Feidler, Matt Moran, and particularly Simon Tedeschi.